month's animation dissection. We're back again. So it's been a, a little bit, but I think I think a good bit. Uh, I am Nixie, of course, here with Zorak. Hey, how you doing? All right. Uh, just settling in a summer, evading the heat. Um, saw Baby Driver. It's like I liked I liked that a lot. Um, just kind of, you know, we're in kind of a dull period of uh, releases for things I'm interested in at the moment. Although I really want to get a Switch uh, so I can play some Puyo Tetris and there's hard to find Switches anywhere. Uh, I mean, do you realize Puyo Puyo Tetris is on the PS4, right? I know, but I want to play it on Wii, uh, on, on, sorry, Switch because that's where everyone else has it so I can play with them. Sure. So, sure. yeah, that and also Switch because like there's a bunch of really cool stuff for it and I was like, mm, fine, Nintendo. You win. You made a good yeah. thing. I'm still kind of angry about the phasing out of the 3DS, essentially. I mean, over time, but fine. Yeah. I just hope it doesn't turn into another Vita. Um, I, I love the Vita as a console itself. Just like it's well made and it it's just, it's just been, it's been horribly mistreated and it's... What, what- yeah. What are you talking about? It already is another Vita. It's getting all the indie games, all the random Japanese games, and Sony's not releasing any games for it. It's just <laughs> it's, like the Vita. It's exactly like the Vita. Well, no, it has to be, uh, is it being floated up by a Persona 4 re-release? I mean, I mean, hey, m- maybe Sony and I, Atlas have, Sony has said that they want, or not Sony, Sega has said they want to have Atlas start releasing their games on more platforms. Including so. PC, I uh, think. I, I heard I heard we might end up getting a, a Persona 5 on another console at some point. Maybe a computer? I mean, Sega's been having a lot of good luck of, like, porting. Like, they pick up random stuff from the backlog. Like, let's port Vanquish over onto the PC. <laughs> oh, it just sold, like, 500,000 copies or something. Oh, that was a really cheap, quick hack job that we did that was pretty good quality, and people bought a lot of it. Okay. Hey, Turns out that works. <laughs> it's almost like people really like the really popular classic games that are not available to new generation uh, user inputs anymore. I mean, it's also partially just people real Japan realizing, like, wait a minute. People buy video games on computers, and it's not just used for, like, porn and visual novels? <laughs> what? <laughs> Which has been a really slow, like, over time, like, realization, like, from, like, the mar- Japanese game market. This entire market, market like, exists. <laughs> that this market exists, and it's, like, it has major value. Because, I mean, the whole thing is that, you know, in Japan, that that's not a huge market in Japan proper. Oh, yeah, no, like, console, hand, consoles really were, yeah. Like, well, that's what I mean, is the, the international market exists. That That is the revelation. Yep. <laughs> so, well, let's get into the news. We have a, quite of a hefty, hefty sure. survey, huh? Yeah, hefty serving of it, huh? Sure. Uh, so, first off, uh, I think this was originally on, I don't think this was originally on Kotaku, but I saw Kotaku covering it at the very least. Um, actually, I think this was actually a... Tucker original where uh they interviewed uh Tomas Romain about what it's like working in the Japanese animation industry very relevant to what yes. we're talking about today uh, he works Shirabako. at Satellite I think um yes. and he he also collaborates a lot with um god I mean he, he collaborates a lot he, he's kind of like a he, he's into the whole uh, internationalization of the anime industry so he has a lot of collaborators ab- abroad I think he sure. did he does a lot of background design and I mean and character design sure. and all that. Yeah, um I think the most recent thing I can think of is that he did some of the technical design for uh Space Dandy. He did the ship. Yeah. Space um, Dandy. And I think um, I, I don't know if he's working with LaShawn Thomas on the next project, but he he I think he definitely was on his uh his last Kickstarter thing. And uh he has sure. that Children of Ether um uh show coming up, so he probably has something to do with that. Yeah. Uh, so I would recommend if any are interested in like a firsthand interview about like what would it like for someone from outside of Japan to start working and stuff in Japan, which as, as it turns out is about as depressing as I expected it to be. Yeah. Uh, I mean, it's not even the anime the, specific aspect that makes it depressing. It, it's kind of a cultural wide problem <laughs> in some cases. I mean, it's it. 
Yeah, and to a certain degree, it's you know tied to Japanese work culture in general. And we're going to be talking about some of this again today when we talk about some of the, uh, the 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 peculiarities and the interesting bits about how things apparently work out in that industry. But uh, if you want to read about this stuff, uh, do a Google search for an insider's look at working in the anime business. But uh, it's a, a interview by I believe Brian Ashcraft. Uh, if not, if not, he's not reposting an interview from somewhere else. I don't know. Might be. Um, it's wor- definitely worth a read if you want to hear like firsthand the masculine European like, hey, what's it like to work over there? And it's like, hey, you, you never go home and you got to work your ass off and it's kind of miserable, but it's also great if you like making anime. So, yeah. So uh, that was one. The other thing is that uh, so one of the weird things tied to Hideki Anno leaving uh, the uh, developer of Evangelion's original studio, Gainix. Mm-hmm. Um, where there was a major lawsuit that ended up resulting in the tune of around about a million dollars. Oh wow! Uh, tied to back pay, and uh, ultimately a Tokyo District Court ruled in Ano's favor. So, uh, Gainix ended up having to pay Ano about a million dollars, ba- basically in like un you know f- previously unspent back pay that he or no sorry not back pay, unpaid royalties. Royalties because uh, I was kind of like they they stiffed his salary. Jesus. <laughs> Yeah, um, and part of this is tied to a, there are a number of ongoing lawsuits tied to the interactions between Studio Kara and uh, Gainix, which is, of course, made all the more weird by the fact that I'm pretty sure that Studio Kara, uh, that's Hideaki Anno's uh, more recent studio that he started, is still involved in making those Evangelion movies. Yeah, I think they're so, working on the final one now. Um, so I, I don't know where this is Putting things, I will note that since this lawsuit started, uh, that roughly corresponds with the time when we stopped having those movies coming out. So, I, I yeah, I would not be surprised because the property kind of belongs to Gainax, but also not. But Ano has severe, he has severe ownership rights. Oh yeah, so. well, it's one of those really confusing situations. So making the movies flares that up, that whole conflict up again. So I can definitely yeah, at the same see time, how. Like, Maybe avoiding, and it get it gets weirder of by the fact that of course, like Evangelion has been Gainix's cash cow for like I think about two decades now. I think it's actually been, and they've been basically kept afloat by that. Seeing as how almost the entirety of what were considered the mainstays of Gainix have bailed at one point or another to any number of studios. I mean, uh, and and many uh, the most recent I think I would say kind of like death blow extraction of talent from them was the establishment of Trigger. Yeah, and you know, Trigger has basically become Gainix 2.0 at this point. Every all the things that people actually put in terms of like, oh, this is a studio that has a lot of very high quality animation and very unique styles. And the kinetic aspect. I mean, oh well, I mean, all the staff responsible yeah. for that aspect have essentially jumped ship. So yep, yep, they're all over at Trigger. So yep. Remember, brands aren't forever, and sometimes you'll love a studio's output, and then you'll hate it, and it's not a contradiction. Yeah, and to be fair, like Gainix has been trashed since like 2002. Yeah, I mean, or, uh, I guess the Gurren Lagan was like their last like hurrah, and then. But they again, stopped. thinking about the the staff behind it, it's basically yep. Trigger. So. Yeah, I mean, the people who worked on Gurren Lagan all went to to Trigger, even so. Yeah. <laughs> it happens. Yep. Um, uh, Anime News Network put up a very in depth uh, sort of expose, I would say, about uh, what's go- going on with the three three D CG uh, Berserk anime that's been airing for a while now. The one that's uh, the been one that's a, a gift in, in a lot of really great places to um, interesting effect. <laughs> yeah. Uh, oh man, I would recommend searching out that article. It's called uh, in, in tone with the other one. What the heck happened to Berserk? Uh, if you just Google search that with Anime News Network, you should pick it up. Uh, there's a lot of behind the scenes interviews in this, which are very interesting given the fact that this is still airing. So they managed to get some very detailed, like, uh, behind Disgruntled. the scenes information. <laughs> I mean, b- basically, a lot of people explicitly saying, yeah, we, we, the director and the staff came in with the notion, like, okay, the only way to make a Berserk anime, given the detailed art that's in the original manga, would be to do it like some amount of CG because in modern day, you can't really keep up with that kind of thing. At the same time, the studio that was actually signed to do the majority of that work didn't have any you know, experience in actually running a show. And oh, then no. the things that they ended up pushing for to actually make the show be technically proficient, they kept encountering a lot of things like, oh, our models are too complex to actually render. 
Oh, the environmental effects that we were actually going to use won't work anymore. The software is broken. Oh, one of the, you know, the other environmental, you know, modeling effects we're going to do to have super detailed backgrounds and like the cross stitching that they're looking to do that the render time on that is so slow that it simply won't work with our production schedule. Yeah. So they've had to constantly be backing off, backing off, backing off. And then just there's a ton of different complex things that also tied with the fact that they had a director that jumped on that's been pushing for a particular style and basically resulted in them spending a whole year just kind of floating in the water before the thing actually started. Yeah. Basically making no progress at all in their actual design for since for like 12 whole months. So I I'll recommend give that thing a review or not a review, a, a read because it's very interesting and it's the type of information we normally do not get out of this industry. No, so. it's, it's, it's often very opaque, you know, trying to look in, yep. in a lot of it. I mean, I'd say both here and abroad sometimes just understanding sure. what's going on behind the scenes. Why, you know, I, I think for, for just like any business or administration or whatever, they don't want that kind of reporting to <laughs> come out that often, but it, it, it's kind of interesting seeing that now also just having it, being reported to us uh, of a international industry, you know, sure. seeing what the conditions are over there, just because of how much the the appetite for it has has grown over here. Sure. Um, in sad news, uh, Artland, the studio behind such great works as Mushishi, uh, they did some of the animation work on the original Macross, as well as being one of the major uh, people involved with uh, Legend of the Galactic Heroes, is currently uh, insolvent and desperately trying to avoid bankruptcy. Uh, they previously were reported just a little earlier this week as being bankrupt, but they're actually just on the border of that. And they're trying to find funding. So uh, if any people listening to this happen to be, I don't know, a multimillionaire living in China or something, uh, <laughs> Artland is looking for you to find some you know, much needed funding to stay afloat. Yeah. I mean, it is unfortunate just because um, I, I definitely want to look at Mushishi just because God, that show's so good. But I'm I'm not sure whether or not it was the the studio so much as the source material was strong too. I mean, the animation quality there and the music and the, the actually. I mean, it's they, not. I'm saying it's well. They produced. did a great job with it. Oh yeah, yeah. Um, you know, and yeah, Artland has been. Yeah, they they've done their the whole thing. They kind of did the bones thing of like, okay, we have our few high quality works that we go you know deep on, and then we have our you know our you know uh just do whatever kind of pull it lazy our a team and our and our uh i would say d team (laughs) sure they had a lot of very d team works but then they also had some a team works that are like wow and you know those existed over time and to a certain degree it also i have to imagine is somewhat probably actually the same team just with different schedules and different amounts of funding for actually pulling in additional staff so that's that's probably true i mean it's it's still sad i just you know, hopefully yep. the the artists that work there will still be able to continue producing their content over time. I mean, you know, sure. e- even in as we will see in Shirobako, they you know studios aren't permanent fixtures, and and the people who yep. work at them and you know, it spreads. Art spreads itself. Yeah. Uh, in other news, uh, the Castlevania Netflix sh- series that we mentioned some, I guess that was about a year we, we, ago. We also uh, talked about already... it. We also talked about the uh, the the, um, the trailer being released because I have a friend who worked on the show, sure. so I was yes, like, uh, right. "That is out now. The yeah. first four episodes are available on Netflix. Uh, apparently, it's pretty okay." Yep, I'm I'm reading lots of pretty good reviews. I mean, I think a lot of people were not sure that you know a, a U.S. based studio would be able to pull off that aesthetic. Because I there haven't been very many U.S. studios attempting that aesthetic in a while, and seems like they've pulled it off. Uh, I, Powerhouse I still, Animation, I, I think they're located around Austin in Texas. If I, I recall, I still don't know why that exists, <laughs> but it does exist. So good on them. Like cat again, it's a dead franchise. The franchise <laughs> literally only exists in like pachinko machines now. There's no way that they're ramping up to make new stuff because Konami don't care. Yeah. So I yeah. don't know why that exists. Uh, also, uh, Little Witch Academia is finally finished and it's up on Netflix. Uh, For those of you who weren't release... already watching it through other means. Yeah. <laughs> and that's the other thing is that uh, the whole situation involving Netflix is a bit of a shit show. Uh, not the show itself. The actual, oh, yeah. No, the show. The actual great. situation oh. is, is a shit show. Uh 
as as I understand it from people who have watched the that particular Netflix release, uh, the subtitles are very bad. Oh no! And <laughs> so the fan ones were I, better. <laughs> yeah, the dub, but there's a pretty good dub as I understand it. Oh good. Um, but but only half of the episodes, as I understand it, are actually released at this time. Oh so god! When they did the whole, when they did the delay, like oh they didn't even do the thing that they said they're going to do. Where they're going to do a big old dump. They oh they, god! They're delaying the second half for whatever reason. What's really so weird is like. Even Space Dandy was able to have a dub out every week. I mean, it's like, not even like, I don't think it's even tied to dubbing, I'm guessing. Oh, I'm no, guessing but I mean, like, more... I'm talking about like, you know, let alone just doing a sub. I mean, Netflix, I think, had the power to do to do otherwise. So it's, sure. it's not like, I mean, it's oh, not well, that, it's too it's hard that they to do couldn't. this. They just chose it's not just to. It's they didn't want to. Yeah. Because they, it's, they, it's the election. whole Netflix model. But the whole thing is that the Netflix model is to a certain degree based around binging. They, they've made a conscious decision that, yes, binging is what people actually care about. And they probably have some amount of metrics that say, yeah, we actually get more you know, engagement when we make it available for people to binge because that's what people go to Netflix to. On the other hand, that doesn't bring in the people who want to actually watch the thing and want to be a part of the, you know, the zeitgeist. Yes, people that's exactly. at this point are very used to watching the things as they air in Japan, you know. If you're trying to do a localization of a work like that, that doesn't quite fly, even if that's the main appeal of Netflix, because people see other people watching it online and go, God damn it, why am I not watching it? I'm waiting for Netflix. This is bullshit. It, you know, people have that very you know, angry reaction, and typically what they then ultimately end up doing is they seek out the stuff that they can't watch otherwise and say, like, well, I have a Netflix subscription. And they're getting my money either way, so why not? Of course, that doesn't really work out that way because that's not how Netflix actually, you know, tracks their metrics. They don't know that people are still wanting to watch it and just not watching it because they already watched it elsewhere. So, meh. yeah, I mean, it's it's just a, a a dumbass backwards way of looking at things, and that they don't understand that the the way in which people consume media can differ very highly. It's yes, it's still a video sure. format, but the way in which people culturally can socially consume things like an anime series that's ongoing or something like a steven universe or you know prestige television in a lot of ways is everybody experiencing it all at sure. once has an interesting effect versus a binge which has you know its own you know i'd say uh, ups and downs and, and pros and cons but it's different and I, I think they entered into the whole anime thing not understanding that the week by week basis is a almost like a feature of the medium, not something that needed to be kind of corrected. Sure. And to a certain this also may be tied to, you know, this might not just be entirely Netflix. This could also be tied to Trigger and uh, Trigger's, you know, various uh, publishing services that it tends to work with. Um, you know, yeah. One of the big criticisms I've definitely seen already of the fact that, hey, Anytime you get Madhouse involved and like Anaplex involved, you know, DVD and Blu-ray prices are Japanese priced. And there's a lot of the old <laughs> restrictions that used to be there on Japanese releases of like, whoa, 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 we can't, we can't release things too close. You'll somehow they'll get end up on the internet, even though it'll end up on the internet anyways, because that doesn't actually stop anything. But yeah, everyone just adjusts yep. their schedules accordingly. <laughs> uh, yep. Yeah. So. Right. Per se. So is, and uh, that's all I got. Oh, that's all you got. Okay. Um, well, on, on my side of things, um, Cartoon Network has released the first six episodes of uh, OKKO, uh, the series that is going to be premiering in August uh, on the actual network itself. Uh, three of those episodes are viewable for everybody. Um, the other three require a cable subscription. Um, it's the new series produced by Ian Jones Quarterly. And uh, so far, I've liked it. I think it's definitely um, Cartoon, ah, Cartoon Network's uh, most promising newcomer. Um, other than that, I think in the pipeline, uh, Cartoon Network is going to be doing a new series by J.G. Contell, the guy that created Regular Show, although it's not going to be on Cartoon Network. It is actually going to be produced, I think, for uh, TBS, if I recall correctly. It's either that or one of the FX's. Um, and that'll be Cartoon Network's first kind of foray into doing um, primetime sitcom. So that'll be interesting. Um, so, I mean, I, I might not enjoy the new Powerpuff or the new Ben 10 all that much, but I, I, they still have some people going in there. Uh, and I'm, I'm looking forward to seeing some more good stuff in the pipeline. Um, 
I, I think they're going to be taking a big hit from some of the stuff that's going to be ending. So they they definitely need to get some promising candidates for long running series later. Yep. So let's go into this uh, this week's subject. Shirobako uh, ran from 2014 through 2015, 24 episodes. Uh, studio produced it was PA Works, otherwise known as Progressive Artworks. Director was uh, Tsutomu Mizushima, who did, uh, God, quite a bit of stuff. A uh, wide variety of genres, too. So he did, like, Hare and Goo, um, Another, uh, Girls und Panzer, Genshiken. I think he did the second season of that. And then Yonde Masuyo, Azazayoru-san. So, like, a lot of stuff with comedy and then a bunch of random stuff that's, like, horror-inspired. He seems to kind of oscillate between those two things. Um, and it's uh, this one was written by Michiko Yokote, who was the series composition, basically, you know, the head writer for Princess Tutu, and also in the adaptation of Prison School, who the director had also worked with her on uh, as the director of that. Um generally was well received as a series um won several industry awards in japan i think it got like the you know the tv animation of the year for like the tokyo anime awards for i don't know what year they actually held the award ceremony but there was that um the blu-ray sales did actually really well like it was you know when they were getting released they uh i think a couple of the volumes did better later so like it, it didn't have like the drop off of sales that would normally happen with the serialized work um and then there's you know the even the creators at some point have said like you know if we you know if we can get some ideas going we definitely make a, a sequel but you know i'm not sure it needs one per se i mean i would i would like another one but you know <laughs> um i'm not sure where i want to start with this one i i think uh I, i'm just going to start off by saying hey i genuinely really like this series i think it it um as as someone who dabbles in creativity it it speaks to me on on certain levels um it's definitely a, it's kind of one that i've watched a, a few times over before it's kind of like uh it's a very there's a lot of really neat things that you kind of pick up on with extra viewings they kind of sneak in a whole bunch of really small interesting details um so sometimes being able to watch it over again you kind of notice like the textures that they use in their recreations of like older or other styles. So like, there's just like a lot of really neat little things going on in there. Yeah. Uh, I also very much enjoy this show. I, I think it was quite good. Um, there's definitely a lot to go in terms of depth, both in terms of, you know, them talking about a subject that's not normally talked about within, you know, the industry of actually, like, here's how anime is actually made, you know, here's the actual details about the production side, you know, in particular, that's a side of it that we don't really hear about, and, you know, with like, oh, you know, running and getting natural keyframes, how that's actually handled from the handoff side of things, you know, hiring of, you know, keyframe animators, how, what, at, you know, until, you know, Shirobako, I didn't actually have a very good concept of what an episode a animation director actually did. You know, like, what is the person involved with the animation direction for an episode actually doing? You know, you could say, like, well, they're directing the episode's animation. Like, sure, but what does it actually mean here? You know, and, you know, through the show, for example, we see the fact that there's a lot of involved with, you know, actually reviewing work that's actually passed by, you know, passed to them from animators and dealing with a certain amount of keyframing to actually handle the overall style and what's an acceptable amount of, you know, quality and consistency from from the animators for a particular episode uh, there's a lot of that going on in, in the show uh just actually revealing a lot of the interesting sort of technical details about that sort of work um but it does sound a very a organic of... way though so it's it's really sure. nice is a lot of the time it's not sitting there you know when it's the concept of of doing like these types of checks is first introduced they don't have a character just go okay here's what this is it it kind of just through repetition over time you see the process happening you start to understand what a lot of these mean. I mean, certain times they do have to sit it there and spell it out, but for some of the details, they do it really well without it becoming expository. And I, I think sure. that and it they, does that. They pretty do a pretty well. good job, and they do a pretty good job of usually making the expository bits make logical sense or you know make them interesting or fun. It's either yeah. involved with them. Well, like the, the, the have, two like, little characters, they end up showing her, her break right. from reality. Uh, those characters end up becoming very, very nice. A lot like uh, the yep. Paranoia Agent episode, uh, which this one has interesting connections with in that the 
really terrible production assistant is voiced by the same voice actor. Hmm. So uh, Saruta and uh, and uh, Takanashi Taro are were, were by the same voice actor. A lot of weird stuff there. <laughs> yep. Um, there's you know they they have they both use the the dolls to do a lot of exposition, but they also then use the two new hires from the. Uh, PAs also teach a lot about the process because, uh, you know, they kind of start, you know, showing how things actually work very much in medias res where they don't actually give a lot of context for like, okay, here's, you know, they don't start from, you know, the protagonist's first day yeah. on the job as a PA. No, they start her, you know, like a year in basically doing her routine work and you're kind of like, okay, I need to understand how this works purely by, you know, figuring out by context which is great yeah well and it it. it succeeds because it makes the urgency of the characters feel real because the characterization and the the writing is strong enough that you can go like okay i don't know exactly what these people are needing but you need it with them like you feel that kind of connection and when you talked about the start i i want to talk about how this series opens and i think it's one of like it's one of the most powerful gags I, I have seen in a long time in that you don't know where it's kind of going, but the payoff is is both harsh and subtle at the same time in that you think the show is going in a certain direction tonally. Like it has this kind of ideal, idealistic viewpoint. It's like, we're, you know, we're going to go to the city. We're all going to make it. And this is going to be like this rosy sunshine goodness for everybody. <laughs> and then suddenly the way in which they cut to the steering wheel in the car at night Mm -hmm. (laughs) and her face was such a strong, like blam like that. It, it, it's really, it's just interesting because it has the, the series has the tone throughout. Like it has the, the naive optimism of someone who wants to create something, but at the same time is completely aware of how difficult that process is and being able to balance that type of emotional dichotomy with with nice gradated shades of of one over the other is what I think makes this thing so powerful as a series for me because I go, okay, it's inspiring, but not in a way that feels like, you know, when someone gives you an empty compliment to make you feel better, it actually feels like, no, it, it, it has an energy behind it, but it's tempered with, I'd say, cautious optimism. <laughs> uh, sure. And the show in general plays many or does, you know, a variety of different balancing acts between those kinds of things. You know, they balance, you know, kind of like, okay, we're we're telling a serious sort of things, but we also have our light comedic elements that are stuck in here. We have a lot of characters that, you know, if you think about it very seriously, you're kind of like, I don't know why they have this job. You know, there's a lot, there's a lot of, you know, times you think about it, it's kind of like. I don't I, I don't understand why this person continues to work here because he he's a, clearly a freaking idiot, you know, it's like Well even even he gets redeemed. That's the thing. Like that's uh, yeah. I mean you, you start seeing well, him like him. actually showing competence and you start I mean even even the guy that's even sure. worse than him gets a redemption in some way. <laughs> that other Although guy was I, even I mean, more of a piece of shit than him. <laughs> Uh, and one of the things I think the show doesn't necessarily strike a particularly good balance of, though, is them trying to balance the, hey, we're taking a very serious look at animation and we're trying to be very obvious, you know, very serious about this and very, you know, straightforward, you know, about how hard the thing is with the fact that this is also clearly a show with a particular audience in mind. Mm-hmm. This is still a, sh- you know, ironically for them making a bunch of moe animes in both, you know, both the animes make being targeted towards that audience. They have a whole heap of those sorts of elements in this show itself as well. Yeah. You know? Well, I don't think it's necessarily making fun of the whole Moe thing. Uh, it's not making fun of it. it. What I'm saying is not, not it's making fun of it. I'm saying the fact that it's telling a serious thing. And then also as they describe and what they're creating, they're also in the show they're making also embracing a lot of those elements in and of itself. Why the fuck did they introduce a literal baby into the second half of the show? (laughs) A literal baby. She doesn't say a freaking word until like the second to last episode. She is there as pure just moe fetish bait. She is literally there for just that. I'd say that or... She's like a foil for the animator character to kind of show that 
it, where kind of like the process no. that someone helped her and then she's passing it along. I think they could have done a sure. diff- they could have eased. I mean, the, the character's personality they didn't need to do didn't need that. No, that was unnecessary. I, I mean, <laughs> I mean uh, but that's the kind narrative of the purpose that's like, of the, the character. I, sure. I just I th- that's what I'm saying is the character I don't, has, I don't think yeah. it may necessarily I'm not saying like this ruins the show by any oh, means no, but there's also a lot of stuff here where I clearly I, I think the weakest element is the fact that there's the characterization of some of the major characters like you know the main five basically as well as like some of these side characters is very weird like there's a lot of deliberate inf- infantilization that's in line with the typical otaku bait show yeah. you know all of the acting of all the major characters is deliberately very childish you know everybody's you know their speaking patterns how they actually act you know is very childish there's a lot of infantile interests and in broad stroke you know, broad stroke you know identity focused characterization that is very typical of that style yeah. you know that, oh we have all these cute girls and they love to eat sweets and it's like okay sure that's fine but the way they're also characterizing it and actually d- depicting it and how they actually interact with each other is very much a kind of like, okay, yes, you can definitely, that's a, certainly a casting choice you can make. On the other hand, you're also definitely creating this with the very conscious you know, mm. thought that you can pick out of the director and writer's head of, okay, this appeals to an audience. We're going to do that. It, it's you essentially know. become the constraints of the medium itself. Because the, which the, is freaking depressing, which is depressing, and and well, the, it's the, there's that scene. My one of my favorite episodes is the one where they're arguing out who's going to be the voice actor for this new series, and yes, that, that an casting show. meeting, just all those scenes, it's 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 painful, and you just go, oh my god, this is and. I, I don't know how much of that is parody or how much of that is going to be po- is Poe's law. Like that's kind of how they they actually think. I mean, it's. I mean, you can see it, you know, because you can, you can, you can see it. See it's, that it's with, believable. You see shows that you can see shows that were clearly casted in such ways because you can see how badly they turned out. Where it's just kind of like, oh, yep, that's how they're marketing this. They're marketing it to you know that particular choice, and you know, there's shows that. You know, go hard in one direction or hard in the other direction, and then most shows try to find some sort of middle ground that allows them to do any number of you know those appeals. You know, like oh yes, of course our main voice actress has to be attractive. Why not? Because we have to have her on a stage at some point, and we can sell merchandise of her. You know, the well, voice and, actress, and the way you know? and the way anime is kind of funded and produced is that all these other industrial entities are essentially sponsors. And yes. so these sponsors, Which, these these recording studios that, that ha- want to be able to make and then sell albums based off of the character songs that get featured in the show are pretty much like partial investors. So you can't just sit there and ignore these guys because they they have uh, their hands on the coin purse. So yep. that that's what makes it and such I, an interesting dynamic. And I would say that's one of the things I also didn't really or that I kind of wish the show had addressed was that there were certain subject matters that the show kind of treated as taboo to talk about where there's kind of like obvious things are kind of like, Hmm, kind of interesting that they're not talking about that. Uh, there's zero mention of funding realities whatsoever that when it comes to anything in the show, yeah, you know, there's, they just go like, Oh, well this animation bit is going to be super complex to hire everybody to do it. It's kind of like, I would have to imagine that, you know, there's a lot of situations like, yeah, we want to stick in a hundred horses here. Uh, you know, the people with the purse strings would be like, we can't afford to bring in all these animators, you know, well, they what, do, what the they hell do are you say doing, that director? like, well, they don't actually say it in terms of money. They say it in terms of time. So I definitely see what you mean yes. there. Well, at the same the, time, there's... I wonder, would, would the insertion of the kind of facts and figures approach uh, of adding that in, inf- would that fundamentally improve the drama of it or would that just be kind of a good interesting detail to add on top well it's more the sense of like they you know they spend a lot of time in this show on episode episode focusing on things that aren't necessarily tied into the direct drama except for the general drama of man it's hard to make an animation show you know or also figuring out what you want to do with your life like that's the other nice thing is that it has beyond anime itself it has kind of like a you know character that besides myself yeah Yes, but there but there are just, you know, subjects that they're just kinda like, yeah, we're not gonna we're not gonna cover at all. Um what do you, you know, there's not no way to really get around that. You know, we the other thing here is that uh 
they always had embedded with all the studio discussions uh, and one of the major people that was always on the staff the animation was that uh, I can't even remember his name like the representative like western entertainment who's yeah kind of like I think it's like the publishing you know like the entertainment yeah the, the guy with the glasses yeah. that often argues the director yeah or is often helping out the director on dealing with certain things. I think he's supposed to be like, hey, we're the we're the publisher representative in general. You know, we're the funding. You know, head of actually making money. Like, it's interesting and in kind of like how he's always just depicted as being part of the staff and totally allied at all times and friendly with production. I I don't know if that's realistic or if it's the fact that they can't. It's very hard for you to go and make a show about dunking on, you know, the people who actually makes it so you can actually make the show. Well, they kind I, of I, I do on uh, like some of these other, I mean, the, the other representatives that are in on that meeting that aren't that guy are They dunk pretty, on those ones. Yeah, they dunk on those ones. But like this guy, he might just be, but th- I mean, also like considering we had like, you know, it's 24 episodes and I think they wanted to tell a different type of story. So I don't blame them for it. It's kind of like it's what's one of those things where like you're dealing with the subject narratively and not necessarily as a documentarian. So they have I mean, on and, and there's aspects to it that, yes, they left out. But let's say you add them in there. Does that change the fundamental emotional journey that the characters themselves you know, are, are going on? Sure, but at the same time, then did the them you know showing the audio guy removing a bit of like misspoken dialogue really <laughs> enhance the narrative that much? Or how about also her how going long to the that, audio how, production how, thing and and show and stomping around with boots and water for a different production? Did that really add a lot to the narrative? You know. Well, here's the thing: is I would say that the amount of time it? they <laughs> well, I think those 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 um things were used differently than what you're thinking. Um, those were characterization moments um, on a part of Aoi's idea of like trying to figure out what she wants to do. Like the whole interaction with that man is that, oh yeah, I started in sound for like a little bit and I wasn't sure what I was going to go, but you know what? I kept sticking with it and I ended up growing to love it. And that scene is being played out, you know, as this guy's passion that developed over time for what he was doing that he, you know, when he said he's younger, was not as interested. That is a way of coinciding with her story. Does that affect the dramatic, the 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 you know, state day to day drama of her uh, work and production? No, but it was one of those kind of scenes that is outside of the direct action that's being used for characterization. And like sure. you know, that one that one joke of oh, you can just edit the audio thing is. is it's like a, a like a three second joke. Like that didn't take that much time. If you're sure, introducing but it also now take a much whole time new do. form of conflict, which is now we have to deal with a certain level of power over our production, which they kind of already did with like the terrible uh, book, you know, the the book publisher and how they also fucked everything up pretty badly too. Like they already did it with that. I think they felt. Perhaps sure. that adding this extra thing, yes, you're adding more drama and perhaps more realism, but that's not what they wanted to focus on character-wise. And then they also had to deal with, you know, the characters that weren't working directly in the studio too. Like you had the the but other. But I'm not even saying it has to be like. I'm not saying it has to be like a major like narrative portion mm. of like the actual thing. All I'm saying is that that is a facet that they completely just gloss over oh, yeah. m- multiple times yeah, in a way that doesn't make a lot of ge- logical so it sense. Stood, you know, so they, it stood out talk, to you. They, it, it took you out of yes. the believability thing. Like, the, I the can fact, definitely see that. The fact that, that they, kept on going, they keep on going on about like the you know sales and profitability in that sense, but they don't ever address the cost side of things. You know, The way they act is basically like, well, if there was infinite amount of people in Japan with the appropriate amount of skills, we'd hire them all at once in order to get things done. You know, It's like there is literally no limit to how many people they're willing to bring in as far as they you know play lip service on it because they never even mention it's like oh well bring in as many people you can afford they don't even say those bare words yeah know? that's there's the well, actually, they, they a- seem to mostly address money in terms of just the, in, the the individually like the way the way it deals with money and finances is really i mean it's kind of neat that you you have characters even having conversations about their income and and their livelihood and but the- there's a lot of really great scenes with very you know, very mature and adult conversations, which was just like, I'm watching anime and I'm seeing these people talking about like just very everyday stuff, but it's, it's sure. threaded really like the, there's that whole scene. That's just the, uh, mostly unnamed, uh, older women that work in the coloring oh. department. Like there's a whole scene with them just talking about 
how this production affects their lives and at the stage of the lives they are at with one of them having a kid. And all, that was really interesting. Like, but that's the way it mostly decided to talk about money and finance. Like it didn't, you know, with uh, the animator character, she, you know, is trying to go like, can I have a livelihood on this? And, you know, her struggles there. But yes, yeah, so like it, it deals with the money on that emotional and dramatic level while it kind of ignores maybe a larger systemic or institutional effect of funding on the creative process and the environment that they're in. Sure. And, and, and some of that's the fact that, yeah, there's a lot of stuff they, they're not going to talk about the fact like, yeah, we don't pay our animators enough. Eat it. You know, we're going to outright tell you that we don't pay them enough for a living wage, you know, double middle fingers to, to the people actually animating it as they actually have that as what's going on. Like, that they're not going to do that. And in fact, I'll point out that every time that they show like an animator's house that's established, like, wow, look at this elaborate, you know, well, you know, furnished, you know, house, you know. Well, these, kind of. They're, they're, they're just so, like a little apartment. though. <laughs> like they're not they're not being shown. I mean, that's in everybody. Like, in, that's everybody in Japan, though. Yeah. That's so like that's though. so when I'm looking at it, I go like those that, that just looks like a normal apartment over there. Like they're not glorifying it. And you see their houses are often filled with just pages of just shit everywhere. <laughs> I, though I mean, like, as as we've discussed, like last time, you know, or several times that we've done this, like, oh yeah, there's animators who've been in this industry for ages who have done AD work, who have make like incomes of the range of like, yeah, I make fifteen thousand a year. That's not enough to live on. Yeah, I mean, they is, they unfortunately yeah, do not address that. Which again, like, I think yeah. it's just the story they wanted to tell, and I'm not calling the show like a documentary. Yeah. So I I'm judging it. I think on. I, I judge it more on the characterization and the dramatics of the story it puts forth. Um, I, I think the the I think the rubric that you're using to to judge it is definitely valid, um, and and I think definitely casts a a little bit of a shadow on the series. But at the same time, I feel that it's possible to look at it another way without necessarily trying to blind yourself either. Um, uh, I'm trying to figure out how to better phrase that, but well, again, I'm not using this as a thing like, well, the show fucked up because I didn't do this stuff. All I'm saying is that mm -hmm. it is somewhat telling that they didn't address this stuff oh, because yeah. those are often the hot button issues that are, you know, the most challenging ones to address. You know, it's hard to make a work about you know the problems in industry, you know, without it coming across, you know, somewhat, you know, uh, insincere. You know, well, so basically what action, I would say is uh, let's let's compare, you know, the way Shirobako handles it versus, let's say, an Aaron Sorkin series, <laughs> you know, who 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 has often done these types of shows based off around professional lives and various things like that. I mean, you know, look at, oh, God, uh, West Wing or that awful Sunset Strip show he had, you know, you could easily, I think, levy the same types of criticisms Oh, sure. On that, and I and I think that's just a a issue that is inherent to, I'd say, the genre of the story that it's telling. I mean, the sure. kind of, I guess, professional professional drama. Like, it, it's dealing with a, a specific kind of world of work or professionalism, and dealing with the people's lives in that. And that genre, because you're dealing with something that's so specific that not talking about certain uh, details of that world ends up feeling like you're violating the story in a weird way. And I, that's just a, yeah. that's just a problem inherent in the genre. And then there's of course the fact, you know, with this is like, they never acknowledge the fact that the shows that they're actually making here sound freaking terrible. Oh yeah. No, but actually I think that's a like, part of the joke. Actually... I think that's, I think that's a part of the joke is that like you're, you're well, watching well, no, these well, people. No, but, they, they, <laughs> but they also act like everybody involved is apparently supremely passionate at all levels about every single thing, you know, everybody breaking out in tears over like, Oh man, this, this show about, Boy, girls, you know, running away on horses, or oh man, this one with well, you know the cowboy is, girl from Texas. It's like I relate desperately to this character. Well, it's like well, everybody think about is it the other so way, though. on board with this, where it's just kind of like, are you freaking kidding? Like nobody ever feels like, oh man, this <laughs> I'm making this show and I'm putting busting my butt here to do it as good as possible, but I also think it fucking sucks. Like there's well, none of that. There's here's no the acknowledgement thing, of the fact that boy, they should, most of animation is bad. Well, he, here's here's the thing that i i find funny about it is i agree with you on a, on a certain level but in the other i go if you are on a production 
you often end up having to convince yourself that this is sure fine and this is great. Like we're gonna make it good. We're gonna just I I need to I need to believe in this while I'm working. Just at least while I'm working on this. Okay, I ha- I can't continue if I don't believe in the basic right for it to exist. Like I just can't. And that's how I viewed it in a certain way. Like. I think a lot of them are are just so used to this is just what sells and this is what they do that they're 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 just over it on that level and that if if they can even you know it's like okay yeah the thing's stupid you know what I'm gonna animate a really cool scene in it I'm gonna learn from it I'm gonna appreciate sure. it like I need to I need to but, think this is great I cannot give a crap about it. <laughs> like maybe that's but you're the, assigning subtext that they didn't actually have though, well yeah that's the thing like, a, I'm, I'm applying that but subtext you're, you're saying too. like well boy what if what if they had that sort of opinion like yes that would have been a great thing to have someone express about it you know except what they well, actually the yeah. only thing they actually <laughs> the only thing they actually address is the fact that like, yeah moe sells you know like oh that this is the type of character designs that are, are really appealing right now like yes they talk about that aspect of it but they also have literally everybody on the staff like like old men you know basically like yeah i I love garbage i love shoveling garbage into my mouth you know it's like garbage into my mouth is great you know it's like (laughs) it's it's like they could they they could have still they could have still said and the show would have worked just as well if they also had said yes we're doing this thing to make money and to make animation and do you know good animation the subject matter may not always be what we care about but we're going to do you know the best we can to produce a good work like you can have that as a reality they didn't do you that could, though, but because to ton- a certain I think degree tonally they wanted to be more there's a tonality issue yeah yes which which is the thing that i think is this one of the deeper struggles with the show in my opinion where you know if i think the show is tonally is aiming for a tonal optimism because you know that's kind of what they're trying to go with with the characters involved and such but at the same time it also juxtaposes very poorly with the fact that the realities of the industry a, there's and, a lot about yeah. there's a lot about this industry that necessar- you aren't necessarily you know very optimistic about you know like i like anime quite a lot quite a lot I also freaking hate anime. There's a lot of it that really, really sucks. And am, there's am industry practices any... that are terrible. I mean, like it's well. I mean, sure. I'd say the same thing. But it's also like, here. I mean, it, you know, it, I also say it's like to a certain degree. Like you know, it's like am, am I watching something this summer, anime wise? No, because there's nothing that actually looks appealing at all. Because a lot of it's just hot garbage. You know, studios shovel a lot of hot, hot garbage to target very specific audiences and very specific niches because. That's how they make the money, you know. Well, they, but here's they the thing. Talk so, about, would you, know, you want DVD to watch? On- would you want to watch the 13 episodes of these characters working on something they hate? Sure. Would, so you would, okay? Because like that's that's the thing is like I think for some people that kind of thing would wear them down. Like, I, but not just as characters, but I think the audience themselves could. Just fine because they they would look at it and they go, well, why are these characters stressing themselves out over something so? stupid and i think a a prolonged negativity that way again i mean i think that's a choice that's a valid choice to make but it would have to gel i think with the thesis that the series is putting forth so it would be sure oh it would be this would have to be like a spin-off show of that titanic studio instead like (laughs) this is this is the lives of those people not not of the the ones that are the main characters of this one yeah, and to like you know, I'm certainly not saying like they made the wrong choice by going down the path that they you know that they. Oh went no, by that, any means. Like, you're you know, just being. I'm you're purely just saying, saying that, that, that choice existed. You know, that's the that idea choice that, clearly existed, yeah. and you know, it also you can clearly see you know this this big gap in what they're actually talking about because yeah. there's certain things that they can't address because if if they call attention to this you know elephant in the, the room, room yes. and acknowledge that it's there. Once they acknowledge that that elephant's there, they have to deal with the fact of what that elephant means for their narrative. So by, you know, avoiding this fact, you know, avoiding that, hey, sometimes you make shitty anime because that's what sells, baby. That's what you got to do. That's got to get paid. Got to keep that money on the table. And to a certain degree, they talk about that outside of that context when they have the uh, the CG company. You know, they yeah. have the, uh, the the one that's like, hey, we're, we do the CG work for car stuff. We pay very good. We give you a very good living wage. We have very good benefits. There's nothing to be passionate about here because the director of the of that studio is specifically going for work that benefits his employees. 
Yeah, you know, that's that's a very that 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 stuff very much. I thought was I thought very that was really good. Very, that was very good and very resonating about that type of stuff. Like yes, you know, and there's a lot of industries out there, and there's you know, this kind of goes across the board, not just in animation, but you know, yeah. any amount of work that is you know, not necessarily even creative, but any work that you have any amount of passion with, you know. Sometimes you have to make the choice between what is a good wage, what is good stable work, and work you actually care about. You know, yeah, they don't always align. It'd be great if they always aligned, but that's not often the case because often the work that people are very passionate about, it's either one very easy to get new people on, or two things that people tend to get passionate about. Uh, passionate about are often things that are very risky. Yeah, and risky things don't have a lot of good financial reliability on that which increases margin increases risk and after a certain point you know depending on how certain you know companies are run that that can flow down to employees you know well that, it, that, it a, almost feels that, like the, that varies the, the way in which you're examining this which is I, I think really interesting is that you're looking at it from a top down look and that you're looking at the the larger forces that kind of shape the, these industries as a whole, so like financing and and what makes things popular and what therefore defines what is allowed to be made within that system. Whereas I think the show was doing a bottom up view because it's it's looking at these characters just entering in, into their into that industry and then starting to hit these different walls um, put up by you know I would say like the aspects that you're talking about. So like the show sure. feels like it's it, it it only did a half view. It isn't a complete view of everything. Yeah. It's the bottom up view from you know from people coming in versus the top down view of someone who kind of sees the larger forces at play. And, and to a certain degree, I, I think part of my views are also stemming from the fact that a lot of the core cast of the the big five girls that are trying to get into the industry, I thought their story was a little. Uh, it was honestly my, my favorite part about this. My favorite part about this show was the you know the production stories. You know, going into the actual details of like these are the things that can kind of go wrong. Here's how the process actually works. You know, here's an ensemble you know, the, piece almost. <laughs> yes, yeah. and, and then I also liked you know I, I like the story of the studio more than I actually cared about this individual. You know, ca- you know he, this character is trying to do you know i, I like the individual ca- character stories within that context yeah. but the actual external story of you know like boy let's juxtapose this with her sister who's visiting you know that which was a very kind of i think what i know what they're going for there but it was also a lot of time spent for something that doesn't necessarily add on particularly well for what they were trying to do there with that sister side story yeah it, it yeah. felt like it was trying to go somewhere and I did feel something from it, but I definitely agree that it could have been integrated better or, or more, more concretely, almost like spelled out what they were going for with that because it ends. I, it, I think it, it, it leaves that, fairly you know, vague. It, it's it whatever it was trying to say felt somewhat vague to me as opposed to being specific. I, I think they were trying to say, you know, show that the the sister was somewhat jealous about you know the the younger sisters you know passionate work having work that she's passionate about. That isn't, you know, as soul crushing as her work. To be honest, I, I was half expecting that whole time to actually have the, the twist be like, oh, actually, I got fired and I, I did not have to take leave. I'm just here. I half expected that entire time that was going to be like a twist <laughs> because they kept on like, you know, like which just well, weird that entire situation. Well, but, yeah, there was. You know. the, well, there was this kind of um, somber feeling on top of it, which was interesting. Like, I think just the fact that we have we feel these kind of complex emotions from the scenes we're given is a huge compliment to the show itself and having these kind of gradiated emotional layers that's going on in a given scene like that's something i don't see a lot in general <laughs> i mean like there's a few there's sure. there's shows out there that do kind of balance that like okay here's the thing that's happening but there's also this thing that the character is going through internally as we're watching the scene. So there's simultaneous things going on. Like it, that is so fucking rare in a lot of the stuff we're yep. looking at. So like that, so yes, while, while it might misfire in that, in, in being able to make that thing have a, a better meaning to the work as a whole, just the fact that I felt, you know, contrasting uh, feelings from what I'm seeing versus what the characters might be experiencing. That was, an interesting just fascinating thing in the direction itself like i think this i think the 
director of this is actually very good at handling tone in general. Like even some of his more serious stuff or when he does the horror stuff, there's this weird sense of humor behind it that he has. Mm -hmm. I think he's also just really good at comedy. Like the the way he integrated comedy into this was pretty well, uh, sorry, pretty good. Sure. Um, like it's not, it doesn't get into like a lot of the typical um, like kind of comedy thing of, oh, you said something uh, that's outside the norm of of the way we set our phrases in in the society. How embarrassing! A lot of it is kind of like they ebb and flow, come and go. Like there's a lot of good repartee. Like I just like listening to the characters bouncing off of each other. Like they, you feel like they have a back and forth conversation as opposed to I need to spit out this line here. Sure. Uh, though on the other hand, I will say with regards to you know the quality of the comedy. They did have, like, within eight minutes of the show actually starting within the first episode, they went, wow, she got titty, you know, oh, that was, as yeah. a, a repeated joke. They had, like, eight minutes in from, like, yep, we're, we're actually doing something very serious here, you know, yeah. talking about how hard it's been in this industry. And, wow, that, that animator got big titty. You know, it's like they devoted a lot of time there to acknowledging the fact and having people go, like, oh, man, she got titty. Which is really weird. It's a, it, it does kind weird. of it's in there for not good effect. Like I get kind and, and of and then they double down on it. They double down on it, but which is very weird. I, like, I boy, kind of like competent, but man, she got titty. It's yeah, like, I kind okay, of liked the joke very... about like you guys don't know how hard it really must be. I got that that was kind of the joke they were going for, but yeah, it ends up being like, and the whole point of the joke is that the way the guys view it and the way that she views it is different. Like there's a fundamental thing is like when she views that situation, she goes, Oh yeah, that actually has to be really hard in her back in, in versus the guys who view it. They go, yeah, she's got titty. Like there's kind of a joke commenting on that in that scene. Cause it ends with her going like, yeah, you got, you guys don't know shit. Like that was yeah, the, at the same intent. time. Though, oh yeah. It was a really oh, dumb, yeah. like it, it was unnecessary. It, I mean, but that, yeah. that's my, I'm looking at what they were possibly going for and I go, okay. Yeah. And also, yeah. I mean, given that it does, it handles. Given that the show oddly has this kind of self awareness about aspects like that, I could totally understand at the same time how you can also go, "Yeah, you still did it anyway." You, you're they, saying they, they that you know it, that, but you're they, doing it anyway. That kind of undercuts. they literally open that concept. They literally open that concept with not just "Hey, that lady has boobs." They also literally opened it with boob cam from perspective of the boobs like with framed by breasts yeah. oh yeah which, like i said lurid it, which it, it's they, still they, they it does it a lot of it's it's not even like it's like oh that's very should. lurid and like it's more just like i like come on guys like i it's like i i'm here and you know not to try to get my my dog on here i'm here because i thought we were having a serious you know time here to talk about animation and then your well, guys as, are all dog whistling said, though, in the back this... and i'm kind of like come on guys well, well here's as the you thing said, as, yes. well as you said like this is almost this is like a prerequisite for the industry yeah. they work in well the okay but here's the boy. other gag i like that's the software thing is the the uh, audition script title for one of the characters that she's she's trying to audition for was um slowly but surely my harem is falling apart but it might be just my imagination <laughs> yeah i saw that, that <laughs> like was good. There, there's like those little things of like oh they're completely aware of how stupid this shit is like it, it so it it does that but then it tries to it it tries to have its cake and eat it too like it tries to go sure. like okay we're gonna we're gonna we're gonna tweak the noses we we're aware of how stupid it, okay we're still also gonna be really sincere about this too we're we're all so. very much all on board <laughs> with this stuff yeah, yeah. so like and, that's where you get to, to that's fair, where you get like, the contradiction like you, that's where you get that weird dissonance is like it's trying to like okay yeah we know well, okay we still did it that doesn't undercut the point we're trying to make but we still did it 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 oscillates between that. I mean, and with the example anime that you mentioned, the one with the, the harem falling apart thing, like the other thing that they also make, you know, bring across is that when she was auditioning for that role and, you know, she, they, they, she commented about this later when she gets drunk and she makes some sounds like, oh yeah, that was basically a porn work. Yeah. You know, that, that, cause she, she, cause she, which is like, cause like her uncle makes a very kind of like, uh, I don't know when she's like, is drunk and saying like, I got those parts right. 
<laughs> oh yeah, the the uh, that's the uh, the guy that owns the uh, bar she works at. Not even her uncle. Yes. It's just the guy. Yeah, and she's like, what? I think that's her uncle, or is it? Wait, or is it not her actual uncle? No, I think I think. Or is that just? I think it's just the. She used she used the the uncle, you know. Well, word, well, that, but well, that word can also tell. just mean old man. Sure. He's like oji san can mean, mean uncle, or it's when you say when you talk sure. to an older man you don't know. You can also just call him oji san. Sure. So. Pretty much sure. you could yeah, call, I, I didn't know yeah. if they were going for the literal, but oh no, it's the, the yeah. translation I had had it as uncle with the capital U. So oh, you know. okay. Um, uh, but yeah, that the, there's a very much there's a lot of examples of that, like kind of like a which which is actually a weird thing to kind of back up. Is like one of the weird things is this might tie into you know the 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 intended audience for this thing is that we actually follow a lot of time looking at these people and you know in detailed parts of their lives, you know. And it's interesting how they actually do depict it as being like, yeah, this work is the entirety of their lives. You know, they meet occasionally to hang out with each other. But like, we basically follow like a good two and a half years of their lives, their mid 20s. And it's entirely focused on them purely doing, trying to get work in animation. There is no relationships or, you know, other things going on in their lives outside of that i actually it's, really liked that aspect of this because i'm so used to these types of things shoving a fucking romance plot into it that i'm just i i was relieved by the fact that it didn't do that and there's see, so much shit to already cover that i go like this thing is gonna have to be a hundred episodes if you start talking about this other stuff too see the thing is is that I disagree with that being a good thing because that not being included is not because, well, this doesn't add to the narrative. It's because, yet again, the whole part of the otaku moe rule is that you can't have any romance involved because the, everybody has to be young and unavailable. This is, again, it's feeding into the thing we're just we're talking about. They don't have any sort of outside relationships involved with any of these characters. Everybody is throwing away their well, lives. Some of them, a lot of them work. are married. Some Not, of them are divorced and have kids. Like they, they two don't, of if, them. Well, they two don't, of them. Yeah, three well, of here's them. Here's the thing is, do they, do you, the, would the series have the time to delve into no, absolutely not. But they don't even pay, like, it's not even like, so the you, bears so basically what you want is it to acknowledge just the series to have acknowledged the fact that these characters are like, Huh? At least have at least one moment where they go. It's kind of weird that I haven't. We haven't thought of anything about other relationships, right? Like, I, I, I'm not. I'm not even saying they need to acknowledge it. I'm just saying it's interesting mm. the fact that you can then look at this and see. Okay. Well, if you, know, you have a horribly, horribly you're, you're, cynical lens through which you're viewing it. <laughs> well, there's three different ways you can look at it. You can either say one, it doesn't add anything to the narrative. Two. They literally, there's zero time outside of work, given their, how much work effort is required in this particular thing. You know, hey, Japan's population is plummeting for a reason. The yeah. only reason they're managing to maintain, they're literally Im raising immigrant, you know, pop levels to try to keep up with the fact that their population is plummeting more and more and more. This is part of it. You know, this is companies, there are companies that are literally saying like, yeah, we're giving you time off to fuck. Yeah. There's literally comp major, you know, like Zybotsu is doing that, which is crazy. It is horrifying, uh, yeah, in a Kafkaesque nightmare it's, it's Brazil all, Terry Gilliam way. <laughs> yes, and then the, you could also say like, oh, well, it doesn't add anything to the narrative, so there's no point. You could just imagine that somehow this stuff is happening off in the background. Well, Maybe all these of, girls that's, have that's, that's, girlfriends I mean, or boyfriends in the background, whatever, who knows. Or five, four, you could view it as a sense of, of course they wouldn't have that because just like the works they're creating, having that sort of thing distracts nerd from the whole <laughs> Man, I remind you that we're not so far, you know, detached from people literally flipping out when, you know, it turns out, oh, this character in this light novel, she wants, she has an ex-boyfriend. Just people, you know, setting fire to light novels based oh, off yeah. of that. Like, oh, she had an ex-boyfriend. Or Tracer's that implies that they gay? <laughs> that kind of thing i mean too. that's a different that's a very different audience a very different thing you know like i'd say you know, i think it's a s similar level of emotional intelligence in, in reacting to it sure but i would say also that well, one's institutionally broader... supported as a thing in an industry like it is in japan versus the other is just a rogue group yeah. uh, on their own yes. that the very, businesses are not catering most... to yeah, and most people, you know, in the West reacting to the Tracer thing kind of gave either were like, oh, that's nice, or they, most people gave a collective shrug of like, sure, all right, 
You know, like, sure, whatever. Oh, yeah. that, that's the character, I guess. You know, that was most people's reactions. Like, sure, she's gay, whatever. Where, whereas but the backlash the does not cause the industry to reform itself to fit that backlash. Sure. Versus Japan, where it's this, like, okay, you know what? You guys that are crazy and screaming about this person having next, you know, having had been relationship defiled, uh, we're going to totally uh, cater to you now. I mean, it's not even, you know, like a reaction. It's purely just, I, I think that stuff sells better. You know, mm. those are the type of character, you know, it's the tropes that get built in, just like the things we were just talking about, where there's a lot of tropes that are built into this sort of work, given the target audience. You know, this is not, you know, the sane in work of the sense of like, boy, we're making a very serious work for adults. This is a sane in work of like, we're making a, th- a show for young adults who are, you know, perhaps more genre, you know, savvy than most, given the amount of references that are involved here and the references to, you know, production staff, uh, you know, references to production companies. There's a lot of, you know, things in here that are meant for, you know, pretty savvy audiences. But at the same time, they're still, atta- you know, addressing that young adult audience that are also at mad horny at all times, apparently. Well, it's also <laughs> and, like, I'd you know, say, like, why the female designs aren't as good as the well i mean that's not to say all the uh i'd say the, the main fives you know character designs yes. are so much more dull than the other design. like even, even some of the other women designs are much more interesting and have a lot more specificity to them and then you have the main five where it feels like yeah they're the kind of the same basic face with different hair but the rest of the character designs are really good it's like what damn it yeah but, then and, they, but that's the but thing then they is, also have the we- but, yeah. but then they also have the weird stuff of like you have the baby, you have like we've got a gothic Lolita that's here. Yeah. Isn't that crazy? Well, the thing is, it, that's they, the thing is like that's the annoying part where it's like. But then you have like the Segawa, the 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 late, you know, the one the the booby animator leader lady. You know, her face does facial design. Sure. The the colorists like the other women in the series for the most part have like Our, have variety a more variety of facial types and and body types and things like that sure. versus the main five are very much more like carbon copies of each other on a base level in terms of just and, physicality and then, and then they're also drawn I'll, I'll note i don't know if you notice this that you know there are certain ways that different body types and character types and you know are represented and drawn those characters are still drawn as being in high school yeah, like you know, they it, definitely the, have that style, despite them being in their mid, you know, twenties. Well, I think they're they early twenties because uh, the, I mean, the series takes been... place over like a year and a half, and yes, she graduates high school out, at eighteen, then spends. She a went couple, to college. Well, she went to junior college, so she's probably twenty-two around the time of the series. I think she's 22 okay, but, or 23. Like so they're not that as old as that. But yes, I mean, they could totally sure. have updated so that way, you know, just changing their their uniform, you know, <laughs> isn't enough, but you know. Yeah, I mean, it's, you know, there are characters that, you know, or there are just a lot of characters in there that are drawn in such a way, and that's not just thing exclusively just for the women, you know. All the a lot of the characters in their 20s are drawn as being, you know, basically just in high school which you know hey, like yeah taro uh, and all that too and yano like taro all the characters, then, yeah yano looks like she's supposed to be like 16 yeah basically that's just a which, big problem which, with the genre we're just well not genre that's the problem with anime in general is that character ages and the way they are symbolically uh induced by lines and things like that is just yeah i don't know like some of like the other animators were you know and a lot of the other staff were drawn in such a well, way well they are i'm talking about but for the main ages. characters that's where it's like yes, okay we, we need characters. to yeah we need to make these main yeah. characters sell to this audience that might want merchandise of them yeah. and so they have to look a certain and, way and, and, and also that, the you know, that thing stuff's and, fine it yeah. doesn't necessarily detract from the work you know it's for what kind it of, is i'm kind of fine go, with it like it they aren't outrageous yeah. and they do another other yeah. it's, details. it's not offensive yeah. no and there's other details there's, to there's nothing that, there's that, nothing that there's good characterizations yeah. like they they're animated differently like the way the characters move and behave you know they at least they're not like that like they aren't just the same robot so i'll give them that i think the voice acting in this is just sure. really well done in general yes and some of the stuff I really love is that when they go into the voice acting section, they have the characters, and I don't know how well this might work for you versus for me, when I'm listening to it, I can really see the thought process and difference when they tell these characters, like, hey, okay, have this character think this while you're saying this line. 
and then they say it, and I go, oh my God, I can hear the difference. Sure. I don't know if you had yeah. that. I mean, as someone who doesn't speak the language, w- were you still able to kind I mean, of get that feeling just by listening as well? I mean, at this point, I've listened to so much, you know, anime of the stuff <laughs> that I, I can't, I can actually understand a fair bit of it as well and kind of pick up the intonation pretty well. So yes, I, I could kind of tell what was going on there. Yeah. You know? But I, but they it's did that with a lot of stuff, which is kind of cool. So like they have that other scene yep. where they change the character animation for that one scene because they go, well, the voice actor did a much more expressive job than the images. And then when you look at the difference between the two, the, you know, the before version and the after version, you go like, oh, well, I can see it. Like you can actually yep. see the execution of it. Or when they do the, um, the, you know, when she's doing the character designs and she's struggling with it and trying to make it look right. If you actually go and and when the show is airing, people did these side by side comparisons. You go like they actually fucking changed the art, and you totally see what they're talking about actually expressed in it. Because like a lot of the problems with some of these shows is they go like I would say for example, um, I'd say Sunset Strip is like the biggest offender in here where they go like this guy's a genius comedy writer he wrote this amazing sketch that had people shit in the floor laughing and then you actually see the skit and it's not funny and it doesn't like it's like this is what these people consider genius you know it's like you know that kind of weird disconnect versus this one they go oh no we're actually gonna we actually are gonna competently show you what the difference is between like all this effort and what makes this good and this bad and you can actually see it play out like oh this guy's an amazing effects animator and then when they show the original drawings this guy's doing for the effects animation you go holy shit okay yeah so this is one of those things where the stuff inside the series is not necessarily like a poor man's version of everything though i would say the exception to this is the cg oh well yeah but even then, they, Which, they seem to admit even when the they, zoo, zoo Park story. <laughs> yes. I, I, I will say, like, there's there's a lot of stuff involved there where they, they just show, like, Z, CG and, like, man, the CG is great. And it's like, mm, Oh, sure. yeah. No, there, there's some, like, uh, there's, like, a bunch of shots that I have, like, that are supposed to be the final shots where, the like, there's planes landing. And I go, like, oh, my God, bad. that is horrible. <laughs> like, it, but, it, it's a lot of stuff, like, reminding me of the fact, like, yep, you even when they're trying to describe, you know, CG working well, they can't make CG look good in anime for a whole variety of reasons. Though I, I did like the bit that they had there where they had uh, the, I can't remember what the name of any of the staff. Uh, or oh, there's the, just uh, too the many, but like, girls. well, it has the 2D versus CG the, the, and then they the, go to, e- sorry, not yes. e- Ideon, the Idepon. <laughs> Yes. Uh, well, that, that was more the, uh, the the thing where they uh, where they're animating the pig landing on the face. Oh in yeah. The airplane, where they specifically have basically feels like the uh, like the director and the animation staff saying like, now people making CG out there, make sure you pay attention to this because y'all fuck this up all the time. Oh yeah. Remember, different things can have different rates at how they move in terms of how you apply keyframes. You don't have to interpolate over every single frame at the same speed. Yeah. You know, it's kind of like a da da da. Fuck you, like, I'm berserk. Okay. <laughs> But, but I mean, that's kind of a broader general issue with, you know, the timing of stuff. And, you know, I, I oh, still yeah. say it. When well, the, the idea that 2D the, principles still apply to CG, like a lot of schools yes. that teach uh, CG animation often include 2D, you know, uh, classes before you're allowed to start doing CG because like the principles apply. And the show actually, I think, does a pretty good job of talking about that. Like, you know, that that scene is is. Yes, very poorly animated, but again, yep. the before and the after, because she gets the advice sure. from yep. her friend and you go, okay, it's just still not great, but you could totally see the improvement. <laughs> sure. But they still have also the consistent thing here in the show, which still drives me nuts of the CG works at like a different like rate than everything else. Oh, the else. frame rates are different because it's too bonkers. smooth because you're dealing with 30 frames per second in video versus also 24 frames for animation and then also on ones as opposed to twos so most of the animation you're using don't get one drawing for three frames yes i know if you're making a show literally about making it you know you should like almost in every other thing the reason why they don't do it is because they don't have the time to do it right because it's a hard thing to time it to be on you know perfect on the ones and such and have it out you know well there's a reason we also don't have a whole bunch of 3d cg only tv series made in the u.s like (sighs) we don't do a lot of those and there's a reason for it is that cgs you know doing a full cg film great for film if you're dealing with that kind of production schedule for the demands of television holy crap can it just not work sometimes 
and, and then the challenge, of course, you know, for you know, one of the big things about anime this you know these days is that yes, you can make it look better for you know inanimate objects, you know, where you can do CG and that look can look fine or you know somehow unbelievable. But man, it is it's also very easy to screw that up to and make it completely unappealing. Like one of the things that drives me insane is that a whole lot of you know you know mecha anime. Oh yeah, since basically the mid mid two thousands has gone fully CG because that's the only way to you know that they can actually afford to do it unless it's like Sunrise and even then Sunrise for a lot of their shows they use CG on occasion and every time they switch the CG shots it's like yep this looks like hot garbage you can I don't tell watch this yeah. anymore it, it ain't cool it does not look cool at all and you know they're it's it's still weird that there've always there's certain shows that manage to get it right where they kinda like, Oh yeah, we had the people on our staff who knew how to do this right, so we got it, you know, perfect. You no know, uh Ghost in the Shell uh standalone complex is still the one I always think about where they had a lot of CG in there actually. Well I think they uh this one even had a couple moments where they use it well, like the car chase scenes do pretty yeah. well. Pretty I'm not saying it's great, but for T V anime uh, standards, it it, it wasn't fine. entirely jarring. Which is like uh, this is me having a very low bar set for for anime doing like CG integration because I'm like I I can spot the crowd scene stuff like without trying at this point. I I mean I would say with the cars also part of the problem is the fact that the actual cars moving on those backgrounds felt oh really they're too smooth weird. they're too smooth for the yeah they're too smooth and then also like something about the actual way that they're framed felt like slightly off where it's kind of just like. The way the cars are basically bounding across the scene, like I, that's stylistic, but it also feels weird, you know, given the CG and how, that's not how the characters well, are moving across. Well, that the and scenes. also like the whole thing is kind of a cartoony heightened reality thing to begin with, which is like a departure from the tone of the rest of the show, which is usually fairly grounded. Sure. So there's that effect I mean, going on as well. I'm saying I'm not saying it's. I mean, and that works for certain scenes. Yeah, you know, there are certain scenes like when it's animated that works quite well. You know, stuff involving the dolls. Uh, that final showdown at the uh, the manga publisher. Oh, I love was that. Very good. That's so that was good. a very good thing of like heightened reality that they don't acknowledge the fact that it's heightened reality. Yes, yeah, so you, you know, can't tell what he because, actually did. I loved that so much because they had the publisher show it up in with the, later gol- with the, the golf the, balls. The, the, that the golf was ball such like a bruise good. on his head. So it's kind of just like you don't know what was fake or what was real, but you know what? That's fine because like you can thread that needle quite well as long as you don't acknowledge, you know, the disconnect, you know. Yeah. As long as the audience kind of is on the same page with you of like, yeah, this is goofy fun. But Satoshi Kon it. Basically just here. just let it be yes. people will figure it out. <laughs> Yep, everybody will be fine with it. You know, they do that type of stuff very well. But then there's other times where it just felt weird. Well, yeah, because it, it's not working. Like it, it's a tool that you can use. That kind of departure and heightened reality. It's whether or not you're using it in the right place at the right time that really matters. Yeah, and then like there's other cases where you feels like they had a joke that they just were like, well, we've got this joke. We got to put it in <laughs> like the one with the, uh, the, the example I think about is the, the, the lady getting the car chase to deliver the tape, which is like, yep. Oh yeah. The whole, the joke, the joke is that she previously used to be a production assistant and the cops know her. Yeah. That's the joke. We're going to spend two and a half minutes of bad CG car chase to set up this, you know, five second joke that really was not worth it. Yeah. That happens. It happens. I think it. I think the. I think they land more than they miss, though. So I'm fine with that. Yeah, and comedy's the best jokes hard. Are easy. <laughs> yeah, the, uh, honestly, I think the best jokes were all the references, like you mentioned, oh, the, uh, the Idion yeah. slash Itapon one, or uh, and when they changed the, the style too. Like the, I like the fact that sure. they did that whole episode where the characters um, are talking about the future of their studio and they're the characters in the show. In, in like the cave talking as well. Like that was kind of a neat little mixture of things, both yep. stylistically and just a neat dramatic uh, concept. But like they, even when they did the ED on parody, like they changed the recording audio style too, to match like the way microphones were tuned back then. They changed the yep. texture and the color, like all the stuff they did parodies of were accurate as shit. Like that was so cool. Yeah. Or, or like her asking like, the, the little matchstick to help girl animate one? the things. 
or, or no, the one I like is Ano being asked to animate. It wasn't Ano. I forget what his actual his in. Oh yeah, yeah the Hideaki on a parody. He yeah. animate the sword scene, and he's like, "Well, can I make the horse into an airplane and have it shoot a laser at all the the police cars?" Oh my god! Like, and that, then, then that scene they do afterward, they show the thing, the blobby monster thing, like. Oh my god! And it looks and that, like an Ano thing. Abs- it looks exactly yeah, like it's absolutely. He- but the thing is that it's it's both how you would do it, and also that type of thing is exactly what Ano would want to do in that type of situation. It's like, yep, that, it's so that, that's well his observed. In that, I interest. fucking loved that. Yep, a lot of the intro, you know, references to existing studios are very good, and you can tell that they're very much informed by knowing people at those studios and such. Like the the Born one for Bones, yeah, for that example. was a good one. <laughs> With like, like the 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 kind of quasi I, IG IG like staff baseball guy. Um, yep. God, there's a whole bunch of them. Like it's there's a whole bunch of uh, it's like Sun Up or whatever for yeah. Sunrise sun, well, I, and, I like the one that's basically I think. Uh, I think the TMS Toei. one or uh, the one where she's where it has like literally they have to blur out like most of the scene, but it's like Doraemon and all these other people are the ones animating the show. Isn't, so, isn't that Toei? The I think that's the there? Toei one. Cause yeah, it's the, it's the little, uh, the little keyframes girl sequence. Yep. That one was funny. I think the blurs make it funnier. <laughs> Somehow yes. that the, all that shit being censored out <laughs> made it even better. <laughs> Yep. It makes them like, talking about how, weird how good, how easier, you know, if we, if we had like this sort of production environment where we were within this, you know, giant, giant factory you know, system. Vehicle. Yeah. It would be yeah, easier, like, easier, but kind of, animators there. Yeah. Also kind of soul sucking in it as they depicted it. So yeah. It's, yeah. Well, again, there's very few, very few studios that have large in staff stuff like that. So yeah. And then there's like just so much like it's interesting how a lot of that stuff is also very clearly like informed of the history of you know anime and like a lot of stuff makes logical sense like the animator being inspired to you know the the one who likes uh, special effects being inspired by uh, Idepon or Idion you know makes a lot of sense because if you've ever seen that second movie for Idion be invoked that movie is crazy in terms of animation quality like that is one of the first things that basically went oh wait we can do this type of stuff, you know, for animation. You can make animation that is just stylistically crazy from an effect standpoint, you know, that inspired, you know, Hideaki Anno to do his shows as well, you know, based off of that. That's why every single damn thing he makes is based off of Ideon in some way, <laughs> some weird sense where everything is And that is fits kind with of, the theme of the larger show too. The idea that sure. it's, it's passing along these influences and passions to others. And I think that's what makes a lot of it really powerful is that all this stuff thematically weaves in and out in a really organic way and it does a really good job like having these characters go from where they start to where they finish you can kind of see how they're the ones that are then going to be passing it along like you start seeing that already with the people you know training the two new uh you know the the two new uh pas and the baby uh as unsuccessful as that character is in terms of appeal, but the, the role of those characters is that like, sure. oh yeah, so like while you're doing the stuff and figuring out your own footing, you're also guiding the people behind you while you're still also being guided by, you know, like everybody is kind of, we're adrift in this, uh, you know, on this chaotic universe and everybody is just figuring shit out as they go. Like sure. there's and an it, aspect to that that, that was really, yeah. And, you know, there's a lot also to be said about, you know, how much they I, I like how much they talk about mentoring, because that's that's a key thing about any sort of creative work or, you know, any sort of production work in general It's like, yes, you bring people on to these who don't necessarily know what the heck they're doing. It's not a competition, though. It's about, you know, you raise up the people who come in with you to make them better. You're, everybody's trying to improve, you know, each other. And the teaching process is itself a chance to learn. You know, one of the characters I very much liked in the show, I, you know, was that old, the old guy animator um, who just kept on Sugiye, dispensing. Yeah, the one, that, the one that was like, oh, he doesn't draw Moe stuff, so we're just going to have him sit there. And he's like, he can still fucking draw. <laughs> It's like he's still like crazy. Then he shows up and does his work. Like, look, I can't keep up with your production speeds or anything, but I can. I know how to actually do stuff. It, it was interesting. Well, then when he's also went, given a refreshed purpose because he's like, you know what? I'm going to start doing little workshops again. Like, shit like that is kind of like, yeah. well, yeah, like because you're actually yeah. going to treat a studio like a studio in the sense that you have people that you're trying to mentor and bring in, and you know, so they can stand on their own feet as opposed to 
having everybody be short-term contract workers that never get to build up the experience to, you know, ever move forward. Yeah, th- there's certain stuff like that are in there that I'm not sure if that's like a a comment on. Oh, that's no, not a comment on that. I'm I, I'm just saying like that's or, or, well, for me well, an no, not, not, like, I'm, I, But I don't know if that like them having that as a thing is like a sign of like yeah we need to do this in the industry or if it's cartoon realism or if it's maybe something Japanese culture specific. There's a few other things in there that I kind of like is like oh yeah that that's a smart way to do things or you know like yeah don't know why you would basically not address that like. The, the fact that so much of the conflict in the story ultimately stems from the fact like, boy, if people actually just would talk with each other, this would be a lot easier. Like that's 99% of all the conflict in the show is like people just like, oh, just to have a conversation already. Like, I don't know if that's just the nature of the well, industry. Well, I think it's also Japan, just the ineptitude or- of the individual people that you're dealing with. Because like one of the bits I really liked was how um, Taro really fucked up that one conversation. So you have the characters talking about it was like I think the motorcycle and explosion Explosions. scenes or something, and yeah, you, you could you so you hear how the person told him something, and then you saw how he expressed that to the next person, and that game of telephone and the way in which they handled um, showing the contrasting you know uh, scenes and the back and forth did a really good job of going like people can just fuck up in terms of like the most basic wording problem, even if it's like innocent can blow up a whole thing. Like that's what made it sure. interesting. But I mean, but they kept doubling down on this inter, you know, dialogue through the intermediary. And instead of just having conversation with each other, which is ultimately how it's solved. This entire problem was like, yeah, we'll just get them to talk with each other. But then that's, well, that's there's that's a the lot thing, of, is like, that's, that's also like 90% <laughs> of the conflict in the show stems from that. Like, boy, if, if you, they you'd be went surprised how a lot did, of human, con- how a lot of human conflicts kind of do go down to that type of basic thing though. I, I, I don't know. Like it, you know, part maybe it's just com- coming from my particular work environment. You know, being an engineer, where it's kind of like, you know, yes, that sort of thing happens. But at the same time, also the big, you know, the big issue, you know, or the big solution, everything's like, oh, well, we're trying to figure out how to do this thing. Why don't we bring this person into the conversation so that we have deliberately avoid any of these miscommunications and you know solve it at the hoof by cutting it off by just like, yeah, co- communication is hard. If you acknowledge that fact, it's a lot easier to address the fact that miscommunication is a big problem. But would it be as interesting to watch stuff where everybody makes the right decision all the time? Oh, sure. But I, that's, <laughs> I'm not saying like that. I'm not saying that's wrong. I think I don't know. I'm just purely don't know if that's, you know, hey, for dramatic effect or hey, that's a Japanese culture thing or hey, this is an animation industry problem. There's yeah, there's no, a few it's, things it's, like that. I, I think it was I think it's just a, a general human problem. Um, at least that's how yeah. I viewed it. <laughs> but the, the other thing like that, I didn't know if it, how we were supposed to be taking it was the uh, what, what's her face leaving her company that paid well to go look for other work. But she didn't actually have any other work in mind. She just kind of left to go purely full time job hunting, I guess. Yeah, well, I think there's also like a different social safety net situation going on. So, like, that, that's what. Was... So that like that's that might be just a bit more difficult for us because like the idea of being between jobs and the whole free timer stuff and the way part time jobs work over there, in and also like uh, you know the amount of income for being able to do certain. I mean, yeah, there's a I whole bunch of information in... there that we can't tell what the weight of that exactly yeah. is. Yeah, and I couldn't tell if that was, you know, again, if that was, hey, that's that's how it works here, or if that was a, hey, it makes a much more cleaner narrative if we do, yeah, a you know, clean cut there. Which like it, you can't it tell if she's narrative. insane or sane for making that decision because you can't measure the weight of what it means. Sure, yeah, that's, yeah. that's just a pure, you know, lack of you know knowledge on my point, and you know, like same thing for like that animation stuff. So, yep. Yeah. Um. Other than that, I'd say the only other thing that really jumped out to me is I loved the way the backgrounds looked. Uh, they felt like lived in spaces. They yep. the, the buildings weren't 100% clean. There was a wear and tear. There's a texture to even the streets. There There's that kind of sense of grounded reality where, you know, even when the show itself would go into a heightened reality or, or be silly, the backgrounds and the way the colors were handled generally helped keep it grounded and then also defined when they were going into more flights of fancy. So I, I, I really liked the overall color palette and, and art direction that they did with the series apart yeah. from, you know, some of the female designs. 
Uh, this show must have had some budget because man, there's a, there's a lot of detail in basically every scene. Like this thing was it, like a labor know, of love because like this is an original. Yeah. Like this is not a. It, it didn't have like a whole bunch of spinoffs. Like it pretty much lived and died by its uh, advertising and, and Blu-ray sales, which it thankfully did really well with those. But yeah, yeah like this is not uh, like the fact that they were able to get a budget for like an original thing and then do this was pretty impressive. Yep. Yeah, it's just like the, like every scene has, you know, so much detail in the backgrounds. Like they spend a lot of time in very cluttered rooms that have so many minor details that have to be kept consistent. You know, it's like you, you see these like backgrounds like, man, like they're not reusing a lot of backgrounds either. The, or if they are, you know, I, I didn't know. It's, 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 it's done you know. well enough that you can you can't tell. Yeah. Yeah, where there's like, bam, we we spend a lot of time in like million, like you know, dozens and dozens and dozens of rooms that are each very, you know, so varied. And it's like, man, someone had to spend a lot of time drawing everything in this room, and that's a lot of time, you know. Uh, you know, there there are you know occasional cases where they do the talking heads, where it's clearly like, yes, you know, they they still do the thing of you know you have to do to make you know the work get done. But then but they also have general, scenes where the characters have the mouth shapes for the individual vowels. Like there's a couple scenes where I go, holy crap, this doesn't, this does not happen. Even in some anime movies, they don't do this. They don't give the actual shape to the vowel sounds. And there was a couple scenes with the director where you see him. It's like, holy shit, he does. Holy crap. (laughs) It's so rare to see that. I think the director was one of my favorite characters in it just because he was such a fucking gross be kind of mess at times and they and the show kind of points it out like he he's not idealized but you can all you nope. can sympathize with him without him being idealized and they do a good job of that he, he's very unlikable but at the same time he's also likable in the sense that like you know you pity him like, there's any, like a pitying you, thing <laughs> i don't know if it's necessarily a pity like you can kind of understand how he is creatively successful but you also kind of like have to be like you just get fucking do it you know, fucking piece of shit or or he is like you, you kind of go like i i can see why he got divorced like you can <laughs> I, I I can see why he got divorced. I can see why he you know fucked up an anime you know so bad that it's became a cosmic joke. You know that was so good. I can good see too. why everybody the, the feels whole, the need. The, the, I see why. <laughs> sorry, sorry. Him getting locked in a cage, you know, like that sort of stuff. Well, I liked in the background of the cage. You can see like certain things written on the wall. There's some like details in there, like that, that, that. There's some really funny details in there. If if you ever go back and watch it, it's like oh god. Um, yeah. uh, God, it's just it, it's everything is just so well observed. I think that's what it is. Yeah. Like, yeah. And I also say that the the voice acting in the show was also in general very good. Um, Fun fact: all the voice actors for all the main the main five were all newbies. Cool. So like the, it Before, was this thing is like we're gonna have these newbies be the voice actors for these characters being newbies <laughs> entering their. Into, I thought that was such a cool idea. That is an interesting idea. I, I, I did find it kind of funny that they also specifically went out of their way to basically, like, yep, it's good to hire newbies in the voice actress roles, you know, by specifically showing how much it worked well for them in the show while also doing it for the show itself. Um, I really did like Nobuyuki Hiyama as the director. Mm. He did a very, he typically does a very samey sort of, uh, oh, well, that's probably a little harsh. He, he is a very particular sounding voice voice but he managed to do something very different and even higher pitched for him with this role <laughs> that i particularly liked like normally he's one that he's the guy who does all the like the robot screaming you know if you have a super robot show where someone screams it's often been him in the past oh wow you know so that's been kind of like a thing where he's like that sort of person so this role is very interesting for him for me so yeah i mean there's just all it's just there's a mix and I mean, I kind of wish there was some more info on like the actual animators on it because I just go like some of these scenes that the way they're like they must have brought in someone specific for the these shots, like the effects animation shots or something. Like yeah. <laughs> there's something oddly yeah. specific about certain things. That I go like they had to bring them in. Like this this thing must be filled with some random veterans they brought in. <laughs> Yeah, like Andy's Chucky really looks like it was animated in that 70s style where it's got that sort of like, dis- not, not, not desaturated, but the really heavy inked look. Like yeah. it was done digitally clearly, but, but it has the look of a non-digital work from the 70s. Yeah, like they, they so successfully or 60s. imitated it. 
That's yeah. what made it so good. Like again, like all these little it's it's the observation. Like they picked up on like this is the these are the amounts of details that you need for someone to believe in this scene or 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 this aesthetic that you're presenting them. And they nailed it. Like I, you know, I, I'm not too familiar with a lot of other PA works shows, but like, you know, th- this I think might be like one of their best. <laughs> Uh, I've seen some other stuff they've tried to do. This is supposed to be kind of a part of a larger series they've done about people working in various industries or just kind of finding your way. They have a new one out called Sakura Request, which is unfortunately not nearly as good as this. So it's kind of like, I think this was just like a standalone, like, whoa, what the hell? (laughs) Yeah. uh, PA Works typically produces stuff that, you know, is kind of fairly good animation quality like this like they have a pretty solid staff like that on board uh subject matters not always or i would in fact say most of the time isn't that interesting to actually make it worthwhile to check out but they you know they've got their chops yeah well and i think they're one of the few studios that actually has a lot of salaried positions for animators if i recall correctly that that could that could very well be that might be something that that adds to that (laughs) um yeah, I think that's about yeah. it. Um, I, I highly suggest it. I mean, it's one of those series when people are like, hey, you know, I haven't watched anime in years. Like, what sh- what shows should I check out? And I go like, I think Shirobako is like a really great one for people yep. who, you know, even even if you're not really all that interested in the industry or like the specifics, I think the general stories and the conversations and, and the, the dramatics of what's just being presented in front of you with the series are good enough to kind of overcome anything that might feel alienating in terms of like, you know, knowledge base from a viewer. So like, sure. That's, that's what I think makes the show really good for me is not only is it have that specificity, but there's something on a, on an existential level going on with these characters that I think is very relatable for a lot of people. Yeah. There, there's a lot of depth in here to actually find, you know, to come to come to it from different sort of perspectives. You know, if you're interested from, you know, what's it like to make anime, they've got that going on. They've got the, but they also have the individual, you know, what's it, you know, like, you know, to struggle with the fact of trying to find a creative identity and what you're trying to do with your work, you know, trying to find, you know, the, the balance between I am someone with an ideal of something I want to do, but I also have to make a living wage. You know, there's a lot of that stuff going on. And then, of course, they also have the fact that if you're a, you know, huge, you know, anime nerd in particular, there's a lot of stuff, you know, in here that specifically is addressed by the fact that, you know, you're, you're not going to find a whole lot of works that are go in there and start talking about yeah bones this is kind of ran weird with its studios huh you know that there's weird in jokes that you only really get if you actually understand it but it's completely also unnecessary like it, you don't have to to have that sort of comprehension the show is not alienating optional. at all in that sense <laughs> yeah it's completely optional knowledge of that you know hey you could come here from any of those perspectives and have a great time yeah uh i will say that one quick thing though is Anytime they tried to invoke Western authors in here, it was <laughs> very funny. It, it it didn't work at well at all. It's like, yeah, I love Dostoevsky. It's like, oh, I've spent all night reading Dostoevsky. It's like, well, she mentions, like, well, she she specifically actually cites a whole bunch of things from Crime and Punishment. Crime and Punishment, and then uh, I think well, they the also do a thing. Men- they also do something men- from Waiting the for brothers, Godot. The brothers. Yeah, the, that that's a later thing. Yeah, yeah. Where, yeah. But with the thing, the sister talks about like, the brothers Karamov, where it's like as someone who's read some of Dostoevsky, it's like nobody's ever talked about Dostoevsky that way. Like, no. come on. <laughs> it, yeah. The same thing with like waiting for Godot, where they're like doing the the play the play for that, and specifically like the 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 voice actress teacher saying like we change all the characters in waiting for Godot to females. Isn't that great? And it's like. Sure, but that is like the least, you know, gender based, you know, roles at yeah, all. Yeah, like, like that doesn't change be much because fundam- the whole, yeah, the whole thing is it's an existential play. Like it's like you could have had like scorpions on the stage there and like we made Waiting for Godot with scorpions and like, <laughs> sure, why not? Might as well. Like, well, that and also the acting matter. in that scene is kind of terrible too. Like it's like, oh, yeah. this is the stagiest, stagiest acting I've ever. Oh, no. <laughs> This is bad improv which scene. Is w- weird, <laughs> which is very weird because Waiting for Godot is like very focused on specifically people on stages giving very naturalistic kind of not playing it up roles. Well, you know, e- even acting. even it's, even um, Robin Williams was able to pull off Waiting for Godot. Yeah. I can't remember if he played Gogo or Estrion, I, I, but he was one of the two, whatever. <laughs> 
<laughs> yeah. Anyway, um, uh, yeah, I think that's generally an endorsement. So uh, let's talk about what we're going to do next time, which will be <laughs> Tom and Jerry, yep. Charlie and the Chocolate Factory. <laughs> oh, God. I, I, why not? Why not? I mean, it's... I think that's exactly what everybody involved in that thing were saying as they got it. We've got we've got two two, we've got great two properties. Why the fuck? We've got not two great cares? licenses. Why not combine them together? It's like you got your peanut butter to my. Oh no, no, that's this stuff. Doesn't you got go your peanut butter and my dog shit. You got your dog shit and my peanut butter. But which of the two is the dog shit? <laughs> well, I, I think it's at this rate, I think it's Tom and Jerry. Although, then again, Tom there was Jerry that depth okay. version of... I mean, Tom and Jerry's been bad for a while. I mean, uh, Jerry and the Chocolate Factory is sure. not entirely ruined by one Johnny Depp movie. Hey, Charlie and <laughs> the Chocolate Factory used to be good back in, like, the 70s, okay? Yeah. It's been a long time. I think we've had more good Tom and Jerry since we had good, you know, uh, Charlie But we've also Chocolate had Factory. a lot more bad. In terms of volume. Maybe. Uh, I guess in terms of pure volume, yeah. Well, I mean, remember the Tom and Jerry movie they did where they learned they could talk? But then you remember that Johnny Depp, Willy Wonka? Well, did, did, yeah, but that's one. That's one out of, what, two? Yeah, but you also had to endure like an ad campaign for that, which is somehow even worse. <sighs> I don't know, man. I, I'm sticking with my guns that Tom and Jerry is the dog shit in this scenario. I Maybe mean, the other's sure. not peanut butter. It might just be corn, but still. Sure. Either way. So, as always, you can reach us on Twitter. Mine is at R.Y. Magnuson. And I'm at Sazerac. So, we will see you guys next time. <laughs>